Susan, are you there? I'm here. Yep. There Thank you, go. Ron. Okay. Um, and we want the next one. And I don't know if I can get the next one. Well, while Ron is doing that, um, it's our pleasure to introduce our speakers tonight. Um, Dr. Lee is a native Californian and has been birding for 35 years. He's lived in Texas for 18 years, where he's a professor of geology at Rice University in Houston. And when he's not doing geology research, he can often be found looking for birds or plants in the Houston area and around the world. Or perhaps you'll find him painting and drawing in his studio or writing and consulting about birds and the environment. Andy is a well-known illustrator of birds and over the last 30 years, Andy has illustrated identification plates for field guides and created brilliant illustrations for the front covers of major birding magazines in North America and Europe. Andy has been birding in Los Angeles County for 25 years. He can usually be found birding Griffith Park and the LA River around Glendale and Los Feliz. And we're very pleased to have Andy as a valued member of Los Angeles Birders Board of Directors. You can see more of their illustrations at their website, which are listed on this slide. Since he and Andy have written a number of articles on challenging bird identification, including dowagers, loons, immature orioles, pipits, and peewees, and they're currently working on a book of Empedonax identification, which brings us to tonight. As Cinti and Andy are going to walk us through field identification of common Western Epidonax flycatchers and migrating ones, which is often a tricky challenge for many of us. So without further ado, let's virtually welcome Cinti and Andy. Okay, go ahead, Cinti. Great, thank you. Uh, let me uh, see, share here. Um, thank you, Susan, for such a nice introduction of uh, Andy and myself. Um, and thanks to the uh, LA County birders for inviting us to, to present. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a California transplant, although I've been in Texas for quite some time, but I still come back to uh, California quite often. And uh, it holds a very special place in my heart, particularly Southern California and the birding uh, community there. So it's sort of kind of like going home. I see a lot of uh, familiar names in the attendee list. Um, so yeah, so today um, Andy and I are gonna talk about MPID identification with a Western uh, slant or Western flavor. Um, uh, the illustrations in here uh, all by Andy and uh, photos by Mark Scheel, Nara Satayan. Christine, Brad Hacker, and uh, a number of others uh, scattered through, throughout. Um, and yeah, Andy and I came together on this because we've, we've always been interested in uh, the really challenging uh, bird IDs, sort of the, the frontier. Um, we, we always come at it from the angle of uh, overall impression, gestalt, um, and, uh, and then also trying to make these uh, challenging ID problems accessible to everyone, including uh, beginners. So we try not to get too much into uh, terminology. And um, so, you know, we all know MPID identification is um, uh, really difficult. And uh, we're under no uh, false impressions here that, that we're going to be able to identify every single MPID, um, surely. Andy and myself still uh, uh, struggle as well. But we thought with this talk, uh, it will be more about when you see an MPID, um, what, do you, what are the features of the flycatcher that you should pay attention to and not worry so much about the name immediately, but uh, worry about making sure you get all the, the right marks together and then building that whole thing to get to, together to get an ID. Um, so I thought, I'd start off with uh, a, a survey here, a poll. Uh, this is a photo by Brad Hacker of an MPID. And uh, uh, Ron, maybe you can put up the poll. Uh, this is just to not, uh, it's all completely anonymous. Um, let's see, I think you might, yeah, you can move the poll around on your screen so you can see the bird. And just wanted to see what 
uh, everyone uh, thought this uh, MPID might might be. And uh, we'll wait a, a, few, a few, seconds. few seconds. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting lots of answers in already. Oh, that's good. <laughs> It's and all anonymous. No one should be embarrassed. <laughs> totally anonymous. Yeah. And the thing is, when you look, well, while we're waiting and you look at this bird, you know, MPIDs are kind of gray, grayish brown, grayish green. Uh, they all have wing bars. They all have, <laughs> you know, an eye ring. Uh, it, it gets, uh, it seems like it's almost impossible to ID these. Um, but we're going to try. So, have enough come in that we can yeah. get a sample? I think the voting has pretty much uh, stopped, so I okay. will end the polling. Okay. Would you like me to share it now? Yeah, let's so? let's share it. Okay. So everyone could see. And we're going to come back to this uh, same one at the very end. We're not going to tell you the answer right now, um, and just see after this uh, presentation whether. Um, uh, we uh, know a little bit more. So you can see pretty much um, everything uh, has been selected. Uh, and then there are a few real conservatives here with the impid species. Uh, okay, um, good. So uh, I'm not gonna say what it is, but let's go on to the, let me see, the next one. Here's another poll. Um, Take a moment to study that one. The, the selections are the same. And this one also brownish, gray, uh, dull wing bars, right? Uh, hint of a eye ring. Um, and uh, you know, almost looks identical to the previous one, but there are some subtle features that we'll start to focus on uh, and really get you to learn how to to see those uh, one in particular is it's got this white whitish throat that contrasts with um the uh the darker face or upper parts of the bird um, so even if you can't really see the color that contrast becomes important do we have enough i'm sorry oh yeah so i think you can share the poll maybe Okay, the last of the votes are coming in and it's ended and here are the results. Okay, so I guess we'll have these polls saved, right? So we can compare at the very end. Yes. Um, good. Um, okay. So um, let me... Before I get going on the impedinaxes, I, I just wanted to um, put uh, peewees up or other birds that are um, they often confused with uh, impids. And um, uh, so, you know, we're going to focus on the impids, but uh, here's a typical impedinax willow flycatcher here, but uh, the peewees are often, in fact, willow flycatchers are um, often confused with peewees or the other way around uh, very often. And the main thing with peewees is they they have this very uh, stiff uh, posture and uh, relatively short tail, very long wings, uh, primaries that are almost like sabers or um, uh, no, and typically no eye ring and very dull uh, wing bars. Um, that would include also the Eastern Wood Peewee uh, for those who are chiming in from the, the East. So it's very important to you know, make sure you, we're not going to talk about Peewees, but uh, make sure you get to know uh, the difference between uh, Peewees and some of the uh, Empids. Um, and of course, there are in, in the West, uh, Hutton's, Vireos, uh, Rubicon, Kinglets can occasionally be uh, mistaken for uh, Empids, but they typically don't have such a vertical uh, appearance um, as the uh, flycatchers. So this is just for your reference uh, for future, but we're, we're going to move on. Um, you know, here's just a few uh, examples of, of peewees here. Look at that really uh, 
like a sword or saber like uh, wingtips there, vertical appearance, really flat backs, a very stiff appearance there, uh, and very dull appearance, no, no strong wing bars, and uh, usually almost no eye ring at all. So those are the ways you separate out uh, peewees. Okay, so what we're going to do is talk about um, the empids. And if you have questions, just put them in a question and answer. I probably won't see them immediately, but uh, Ron will keep track of them and we'll get to them at the very end. Um, and yeah, so here are the main ones that we'll be talking about. Uh, these are the Western empids, Pacific Slope, Cordilleran, of course, uh, but we're going to treat the Cordilleran and the Pacific Slope the same. Uh, or indistinguishable uh, besides voice. Um, Hammonds, flycatcher, uh, dusky, gray, and willow. And then of course, least would be um, the next, the, the most common or uh, vagrant that we might get out in California, vagrant uh, empid. So we're, we put those there. Um, and you can see, gosh, they, they all look um, incredibly similar and if you're a beginning birder, you might look at this and just think it's it's almost impossible to uh, uh, to get started on this. Um, and what I will tell you is um, Andy's illustrations are we, we work uh, together a lot on this, and he he uh, he's illustrated them I, I would say perfectly. Um, and uh, what you'll find in a lot of field guides is sometimes um, some of those subtleties aren't aren't uh, uh, illustrated that uh, well, and that leads to some of the confusion that's that's out there. Um, before we get into the ID, um, I thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, status, uh, some of the, uh, what will you see in, uh, in Southern California or Los Angeles County in particular here. Uh, this is the breeding bird uh, atlas. Um, that uh, Kimball Garrett, I think, uh, ran. And um, so Pacific Slope flycatchers, they, they breed uh, throughout um, the coastal California, and they prefer to be in sort of the shady uh, canyons. Um, you don't see them so much uh, in the really arid uh, northern slopes here, uh, pretty much more on the humid parts down on the coastal uh, slope. Um, a few will winter in Southern California every year, um, but otherwise they're primarily a, a spring, summer, uh, and early fall bird. A dusky flycatcher um, uh, has a very limited breeding range in Los Angeles County. It prefers the dry, the drier uh, slopes, the coniferous slopes um, of the San Gabriels um, or the San Bernardinos uh, further east. And uh, we will see them in migration. They're not uh, super common uh, in migration, although if you get out towards uh, the Mojave, you'll, you'll see them uh, more often in, uh, migrating, of course. Um, they, they are pretty rare uh, in the winter, uh, certainly rarer than um, Pacific Slope. And maybe and I may be wrong on this, but uh, you know, at least flycatcher might actually uh, be something that you have to really watch out for, even though you don't think it should uh, uh, occur here. But dusky can be quite rare in the winter. Uh, gray flycatcher, that's uh, really a bird of the basin and range up further north in Nevada, Eastern California. But uh, uh, you do get some uh, coming down here with some confirmed breeding and some probable uh, possible breeding. Um, but it's not a bird that we see too often uh, uh, in spring migration uh, or fall along here, uh, along the coast. Um, but uh, you do see these fairly regularly, although still um, in low numbers, uh, in the winter all throughout um, the coast, especially down in the Inland Empire or further uh, east. You can usually find one or two every winter in, in like, say, Riverside County. And uh, willow flycatcher, uh, this would be the southwestern uh, willow flycatcher, that subspecies. And it's a, um, uh, it, it, historically, uh, 
have probably bred in the region, but uh, prefers these uh, willow thickets, but um, they've been largely extirpated and are confined mostly to um, Colorado uh, River uh, Valley, the upper Colorado River. Um, but uh, we will see them uh, during migration um, fairly regularly. They are pretty late spring migrants. And for those who, who are chiming in for the east, uh, Willow and Alder, similarly out in, say, Texas, or the southeast are also very late, um, they're sort of coming in in May, even as, as far south as, as Texas. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, one of the latest arriving uh, spring migrants and very often confused uh, with uh, peewees, um, both uh, in the west and also in the east, uh, they're confused with peewees. And I, I might be able to say a little bit later on why that um, is the case. Uh, and then Hammond's flycatcher, um, they, they don't breed in Southern California. They're up in the uh, coniferous forests of uh, the, the American West and the Sierra Nevada. They do migrate in large numbers through the deserts and through the coast here. So they, they're pretty, pretty common. Um, and uh, you, oh, I should mention with the willow, there are no records as far as, far as I know a willow flycatcher in the winter um, in Southern California, or they'd probably be all suspect if they've been recorded. There was this, just to chime in there, I think there's like one incredible record from March in LA County, which might be like the only oh, record yeah. in lower 48, I think. So I suppose- They're, I they're March, incredibly I think, rare. I don't know if it had overwintered or not. I think Kimball would know. I'd sort of seen it in eBird, but yeah, it seems to be the only sort of bird earlier than, early May in, in the whole of the lower 48, in eBird at least, so. That's remarkable, March record, yeah. Yeah, willows, they just, just don't winter in, in the United States anywhere. Um, and so the, any record is pretty remarkable. Um, Hammonds, uh, um, there may be a few wintering uh, in Canada, pretty rare winterer, although they are regular winterers down in Southeast you know, Arizona, at the desert Southwest all the way out to West Texas. So they don't go that far and they winter just in Northern uh, Mexico. Um, okay, so Andy has this uh, nice kind of sketches here, um, which are to illustrate e either his intent was to torture you, I don't know, <laughs> but they, uh, he purposely um, didn't put color and, and um, a lot of the uh, the field marks that you, you typically think of, like uh, face patterns, eye lines, and you know, uh, streaks, um, there's basically the flycatchers are all pretty nondescript. Uh, but there are subtle differences in the shapes, and um, and obviously the shapes of these birds are dynamic. The birds are moving. Uh, you can be misled uh, by a single photograph. So you, you know you really want to uh, sit and observe uh, the bird. But despite these being, you know, variable at the, or dynamic, I should say, um, uh, when you it's this holistic approach to looking at a bird that we're going to try to get across, and it's sort of like, um, you, you know, you know your your friends, you can identify them walking down the street somehow. You don't actually have to see their face from a couple blocks away, but you know it's, you know, I know it's Andy, right, walking down the street. And it may, I may not know how to describe it, but it's probably maybe the, the posture, the way uh, he walks or something like that, right? And so that's what, you know, you can actually see this in these birds, just the way they hold themselves. And we're gonna try to uh, get some of those um, features across. Um, so this, this is a bit of a technical uh, slide and uh, I'm not going to spend much on it right now. I'll come back to it later. What this is on the right is a score, uh, a score card, um, and it basically has the birds, um, all the MPEGs up here, and then all these different features. So, say like eye ring, you know, it could have a, a no eye ring, a thin eye ring, a messy eye ring, a bold, crisp one, tear shaped, etc. And you just score it, and uh, any each bird 
actually has um, not one individual field mark, but a range of field marks. For example, a least flycatcher can have anywhere from a bold to a messy um, eye ring. And so uh, the, the challenge of flycatchers is that uh, these are kind of fuzzy field marks for, for all the flycatchers. And so this is why uh, what we're going to do is focus on the, the, the holistic uh, view, not um, uh, hang our ID on just one um, ID uh, mark. And this schematic diagram right here is just to show what we did was put the, uh, each of these squares, uh, like WI is willow and this is alder, um, how close they are, that kind of tells you how close uh, they are in terms of all these features in the scorecard. For example, uh, least is most likely to be confused with Hammonds um, and Dusky. And in fact, Alder, uh, that's an underappreciated misidentification problem. Uh, yellow bellied with Westerns, of course, and yellow bellies with least. You, here you have the Peewees the closer to the Willows and the Alders. So that just gives you a feel for where things uh, uh, lie. Um, We've, we've got some weirdos here like tufted flycatcher and buff breasted, just ignore those and pine. That was for completeness. So, um, so I'm gonna now go to these uh, fuzzy field marks and we're gonna walk through them one by one um, and then try to assimilate them uh, at the end. And I'm gonna start off with the, uh, the, field, the field marks or the features that um, we commonly hear about when we're talking about um, MPIDs, and then we're going to migrate into thinking about new features or features that have been talked about less and how those might be uh, a little bit more diagnostic. So the first one that we, I often hear is overall coloration. And um, like the, uh, if you let me move this up here, uh, we have the names of the, the birds down here that will be uh, categorized with, say, a greenish yellow um, uh, plumage. And of course, Pacific Slope and yellow bellied would be uh, greenish yellow. Um, and then something really dull and gray, well, gray flycatcher uh, ap aptly named. But one has to be very careful about overall coloration because there are dull uh, Pacific Slopes that could fall into this range. There are uh, Hammond's flycatchers or least flycatchers or Acadians that I've seen that could fall in this range. And gray flycatchers can even appear slightly greenish or yellow um, uh, depending on their age and where. And, and, and then of course, uh, lighting conditions um, can control uh, how you perceive uh, color. And, uh, and then to make matters worse, uh, your uh, definition of what's olive gray may be very different than uh, my definition of what's olive gray. And then if we start talking to each other and not uh, agreeing on this, the, how we use that terminology, we will end up confusing each other. So um, I think coloration is good when you have the extremes. You always should note that. But uh, I actually rarely use color um, in identifying um, and pitinaxes because of all these potential pitfalls. So we're going to skip that. Um, the other one we hear a lot about is um, the eye ring. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to say is, well, uh, you know, you can have the indistinct one where it's, uh, there's not much of one uh, to what uh, is, is a messy one. Uh, and what's not shown here is there might be a bold and crisp one. Uh, like the Acadian, since we're talking about the West, uh, we didn't put that here. And then you have the very diagnostic one at the Pacific Slope, that teardrop uh, uh, shaped eye ring uh, right there. And, and then also what we didn't really talk about, we also, also hear a lot about pale lores, but I'll be the first to tell you that just about every uh, MPID has pale lores, uh, depending on <laughs> when you're looking at it. And the uh, eye rings can be um, highly variable. Uh, even Pacific slopes can have that rear end there missing sometimes. We had a Pacific slope invasion out in Texas and the eastern 
U.S. this year, and if you look at some of the photos, many of them are are, are have eye rings that are much more like a yellow-bellied um, or messy eye ring. So eye ring is something to pay attention to, but you really have to be quite careful uh, at them. I think the best is when you see you can say there's no eye ring, or there is a distinct and bold, uh, albeit it could be messy, uh, eye ring. Anyway, you can see here. Uh, all of these guys have messy eye rings, so uh, it, it's not uh, uh, necessarily a great field mark uh, by itself. Um, bill shape uh, we, is something to pay attention to. Um, there are, of course, the, in the end members, when you see a Hammonds or at least, um, they typically, you can tell, they have small, short, um, stubby uh, bills, and at the other extreme, uh, gray flycatchers, they all have a, uh, a long, somewhat narrow, narrow from below, I mean, uh, bill. And, uh, and then you, you have everyone in between, uh, and that's where uh, most of the confusion uh, lies, where you could have a slightly longer billed Hammonds and a slightly shorter bill dusky and there could be some overlap and uh, we could be debating uh, for ages if we just focus only on the, the bill. So those are uh, just words of caution, um, but do note uh, all of these. And when we uh, talked about um, you know, does a bird have a, what's, what's its bill length, you know, with that scorecard, you don't have to say, um, that it, if you're not sure, uh, you might know that you might feel it's a long bill or maybe a medium length, medium length bill and you know it's not small. So you can kind of tick off two of those um, uh, categories. It could be a long or medium. Uh, even that is uh, still useful, even though there's some uh, overlap. Um, okay, uh, lower mandible color. Um, that goes from end member of mostly dark, uh, like Hammond's flycatcher, where it is pretty difficult to see any pale base of the bill. You really have to uh, inspect it incredibly carefully to see that, all the way to a gray flycatcher, which has a, a largely orange uh, uh, lower mandible. Pacific slope, for example, is completely orange and almost never shows any duskiness. And then, um, so uh, those those are are uh, generally better than some of the other features we just uh, discussed, or they they don't vary uh, as much. Um, but when you have things in the intermediate part, it can get kind of confusing, and uh, and it might depending on lighting, it may be actually very hard to see how bright the lower mandible uh, is. Um, so I hope I'm not confusing you, uh, but uh, uh, I should mention the reason why um, we are doing it this way uh, with Andy drawing um, these birds side by side is the goal is that you would have these bills, uh, examples of the bills all lined up here. When you see your bird, you go and say, well, do I think it's over here or over there? Uh, again, uh, one person's dark uh, is different from another person's uh, pale. So um, making sure we have essentially a ruler. So this would be a darkness ruler. Um, that's the goal of what we're trying to do with for you all, just to make sure we're all talking the same uh, language. And this will become uh, more and more apparent as we move into other uh, features. So this is um, what I consider one of the uh, um, most uh, useful or helpful features is um, the primary uh, extension. And so the bird's wing is uh, made up of what uh, these flight feathers here. There's this stack of feathers that the, the inner parts of the wing, uh, these are the tertials, and they fold up to form this sort of rectangular stack of like cards here. And then the outer part of the wing, the flight feathers, they stick out. Um, they're the ones used for flying. And the primary extension is a measure of 
how far the primaries stick out from the end of the uh, uh, tertials. And it's not, uh, if you can ban the bird, you might measure the absolute length, but we're not into, we're not gonna catch the bird. You wanna see it out in the field or you photograph the bird. So you don't have any absolute. So we're gonna be looking at relative um, uh, lengths. So um, the thing to compare it to how much it sticks out is comparing it to uh, the, the width uh, or the length of the uh, tertial uh, stack. So you can see from over here, this one see is short compared to the whole, uh, the entire wing or the tertial stack. And then over here, you have a long one uh, right there. Um, so it's sticking out more. Um, and so it's something like a Hammond's flycatcher uh, typically has uh, uh, long primary extensions. And that is, I guess, yeah, out in California, that's really our only one with, with a very long uh, primary extension. Uh, willow um, has medium to long, um, but uh, when you really see long, you can pretty much rule out um, everything else, except for some vagrants from the east. Um, and then short primary extensions at, at that uh, end of the spectrum, dusky and gray flycatcher, um, those are pretty uh, diagnostic. Again, these are dynamic features, depending on the way the bird's holding itself. Um, uh, it could, you could see some variability, so you have to be a little bit careful. So sometimes uh, anything with their intermediate uh, lengths um, it can be tough to um, uh, be diagnostic. Um, but when you see an MPID, always note, make, make the note of that primary uh, extension there. Okay, tail length. Um, uh, tail length, again, uh, we aren't measuring the absolute length. It really is a relative uh, feature or proportional uh, feature. And uh, the way to think about uh, tail length is it's, um, it, it's sort of a, an impression actually that is um, uh, influenced by also the primaries here, the primary projection. So for example, a Hammond's uh, flycatcher here uh, appears to have a short tail because the wing tips are, are so long. Same thing uh, with willow. Now, interesting, the least right here has a short primary ex extension. And it actually does have a, a, a short tail in an absolute uh, sense. Um, and then something like a gray flycatcher, in an absolute sense, its tail is already a little bit longer. And that effect is accentuated, the impression, by the uh, shorter uh, wingtips primary uh, extension. So uh, I hope uh, you can you can see that. So um, the other feature uh, is to think about um, crown shape, and uh, we're starting to get into subtle features, but features that could be very um, uh, important uh, when you put it together with all the other. Uh, uh, field marks. So uh, do make note of whether obviously if it has a crest, a distinct crest, that's a good sign you've got a Pacific slope. Um, so study your Pacific slopes to get a feel of what, what we would consider a crest. But some birds could have a peak, a slight peak. Some are have a flat crown like a uh, gray flycatcher. And then one that's more on the rounded uh, side. Uh, like Hammond's, uh, Dusky, or, or Least. And of course, Hammond's can sometimes show a little peak. Um, it could also, uh, Least can show a little bit of peak. Uh, they will not show a crest, and they very rarely will show something like a flat um, uh, crown. A dusky could show, um, uh, could be somewhere in between round and flattish. So uh, you just have to know where in the spectrum each of your flycatchers uh, lie. And again, I don't want to worry so much about the ID, but just so that you can see these um, uh, uh, different shapes here. 
um, we're going to have a poll soon to, to break it up a little on this, uh, the forehead uh, angle. Uh, this, this is something um, I think is relatively new. I haven't heard of too many people talking about this. Um, and as far as I can tell, it's not in the literature, or at least the published uh, literature. But uh, it, it can be actually quite diagnostic. Um, it, it, uh, the way to think about it, so here's the crown. That's the shape of the crown. But the forehead angle, as Andy has drawn here, is this angle, if you were to put a line along the culmin of the bird, and then you know, the tangent to where the, 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 the forehead sort of meets the, the base of the bill. This sounds so technical, but it really isn't. What I want you to see is you can, you can see the differences. You go to something like the Hammonds. Hammonds has the steepest forehead, See that? See how steep? I and mean, if you look at some Hammond photographs, it's almost at a 90 degree uh, angle. And then you can go all the way to like a, a gray flycatcher, and and the, that uh, forehead that where it meets the uh, uh, bill is is much shallower. And that the same thing goes with uh, willow flycatcher. Um, and this works well also for a lot of the eastern uh, empids. Um, and why I Bring it up is, you know, we often talk about Hammonds as a big-headed, round-headed um, uh, flycatcher, and that's partly because, well, it's got a rounder crown, but it's uh, got a steep forehead. It really makes it kind of like a circular uh, head there. Um, and so out here in Texas, for example, when we have mostly lease, but we're always looking for our Hammonds or in California, you might be looking for a least vagrant, and they may look the same, least and Hammonds. Uh, uh, it turns out the forehead uh, steepness um, is, is, can be quite diagnostic uh, there. So here I'll give you an example. Um, I'm not going to tell you what uh, bird this is, but uh, Ron, if you could put up the survey, uh, the poll, and just we're going to ask, do you think this is given those uh, rubrics, uh, metrics that are from Andy's illustrations, would you call this a shallow, intermediate, or steep uh, forehead? And this is a nice profile shot. And while we're waiting, I'll note I would call this a long bill. And I would call this a fairly flat head or crown. Long tail, even though it's kind of obscured, it does, does feel long there. And short primary extensions, you can't really see it too well, but it, it's, it's there. And we'll get into it later. The wing bars are there, but they don't contrast much with the back. So um, the polling is slowing down now. OK. Uh, I'm going to end the poll in a couple of seconds. Get your last vote in. And it's ending. Would you like me to share it? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Very good. Yeah, so um, shallow. And I would have called that shallow too. So, um, and uh, an intermediate and steep. Uh, for those who called it steep, um, th there's really, of course, no wrong answer here. What, uh, what we want to do is, uh, after the talk, you can go back and look at uh, um, those illustrations that Andy did. And you, know, you take the photo and just compare to the different uh, photos. And that'll help get your eye acclimated to whether it's steep or, or shallow. But um, I'm very uh, pleased that you know, 86% said it's shallow. So what that tells you is that um, you, the human eye can actually see some of these subtle features, uh, which sound very technical, but in fact, um, you can see it. And that's, that's all Andy and I are trying to get across is how do you see it? How do you uh, uh, communicate what you see into, um, into words and uh, so, so field mark that is useful. 
And just to remind, I'm sorry to interrupt, just yeah. to remind everyone and to let you know, this um, this webinar is being recorded. So you everyone will have plenty of opportunity to go back and restudy and these drawings, things like that. Yeah, I think uh, you'd want to come back and study them because uh, I'm sure we're, we're zooming through this thing really quickly. Um, well, here's another one, another photo, thanks to Brad. Uh, uh, I, what do you think uh, if you could put the poll on this up on this one same question shallow intermediate or steep and I purposely found a photo here where the bird's head was angled uh, towards you so you couldn't actually draw those lines that that Andy did on, on this uh, particular bird but I still believe you probably can see um, whether it's steep shallow or intermediate um, By the way, that previous bird was a gray flycatcher. And it, it hits all the all the scores score marks of a gray flycatcher. And uh, this one, you want to what you'll notice is while we're waiting, a long primary extension, relatively short tail, at least extending beyond the primaries. Um, it's got a Medium, small to medium length bill, uh, bold wing, fairly bold wing bars. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the wing panels a little bit later. Dusky bill, yeah. The poll is done? Yeah, I was gonna say the poll is, the voting is slowing down. Okay. And it's ended and here are the results. There we go. Uh, it, Great. Well, that's promising. Um, so 65% said it's steep. I also would have called this a steep one. Uh, although I, I see there's some 33% suggest it's intermediate and, and uh, that's I'm sure because the bird is not, uh, it's not a perfect profile uh, shot. And so um, uh, I think once you get practice looking at these birds in the field, looking at photographs, looking at our rubrics or metrics that uh, Andy has illustrated, I think you, we'll all, we, you can very quickly kind of calibrate your eyes to you know what's steep and what's shallow and, and so forth. Um, but yeah, we can see that this is steep. This is a Hammond's flycatcher. So a very steep forehead, um, rounded crown here. Okay. And uh, yeah, here's here's uh, Hammond's flycatcher on the left, and um, I won't do a poll for this one. But on the right is actually a least flycatcher for uh, comparison, and uh, for most intents and purposes, they look almost the same, uh, except uh, one is the primary extension here is sort of medium length, and here hard to see, but look at where the tertials end and look at how long the primaries are. Um, but if you can't see that, like it, if it were covered, uh, let's look at the forehead angle. Look at this, in this particular case, a sort of medium or even low um, forehead angle. And here's a steep forehead angle. I've never, almost never seen a least flycatcher with a steep forehead angle. Um, and by the same token, I've almost never seen the Hammonds with a shallow uh, uh, forehead angle. So these, you can use those as a hint to uh, maybe if you're in Southern California in the fall and you see a, a, a small uh, empid, short-tailed empid, uh, if you see that it doesn't have a steep uh, forehead, um, it might be a sign that you should take a closer look that it might be a least flycatcher. Okay, um, we're now gonna go move into back to color, but not so much on the absolute color, but color contrasts. Uh, so comparing one part of the bird to another part, you know, how do these parts contrast? So one is, uh, and that's usually, I think that's the better way of looking at color when we're talking about MPEGs, not the absolute color. So here, to illustrate here, uh, wing bar contrast. 
um, they all have wing bars here, but uh, what you want to focus on, you know, uh, and of course the wing bars uh, are, they contrast with the wing itself. But what we really mean by the wing bar contrast is it's contrast relative to the rest of the body, the back here. So you can go from one here where uh, it, it is much brighter, uh, say, than the mantle. And then here, um, although they're bold wing bars, uh, it's only subtly uh, bolder or brighter uh, than the back. Uh, so whenever you say it's got strong wing bars, always reference it to something else. In this case, the best place to reference it is the back. Uh, so everything we were talking about is you have to have a reference. You have to calibrate your eyes and always pick some part of the bird to calibrate on. So things like gray, dusky, willow have um, wing bars that are, sometimes they're just dull and sometimes they, they just don't contrast with uh, the back and where uh, Pacific Slope and least flycatchers have uh, contrasting uh, wing bars relative uh, to the mantle, although uh, the mantles could be very different colors and the wing bars could be slightly different colors but the contrast is both strong in, in the two. Hammonds can have uh, anywhere from medium to maybe slightly strong uh, wing bar uh, contrast. So here, uh, a, a couple examples of gray, least, Hammonds, and the, uh, again, they all have wing bars, but uh, look at this upper wing bar, and it sort of melts into the back of the, uh, uh, the mantle here in terms of the colors, not a strong contrast. And you go all the way to the other extreme, uh, least, um, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's white and, and uh, this is a darker green. And so there's a strong uh, contrast. Even if I change this all to grayscale, you would see this strong contrast. Um, and Hammonds is somewhere uh, in between. Often, uh, uh, you, you'll hear people talking about the wing bars contrast relative to the actual uh, wing feathers. Um, and indeed, say, uh, uh, least may have a blacker wing than a gray, but when you're comparing to uh, Hammonds, that, that becomes a little bit of a harder uh, cell, the background wing color. And also wear can, and lighting can uh, change that. So I tend to use the contrast with the, the mantle. And uh, while you're on the wings and from the wing bars, go down uh, to the tertials here, or let's go to this one, and the primaries. We've talked about the structure, so the extension, but now we wanna talk about something called the wing panel contrast, which, which is uh, in the literature here and there, um, uh, it's not talked about much in the field guides, but uh, um, although in like Sibley's guide, it's very well illustrated uh, as, as well. Um, and so what we're trying to uh, talk about here is, so the tertial stacks, they all have these pale edges to the feathers, right? And it turns out that the primary stack um, is where it's more variable. Uh, in, between species, that is. So in least, for example, in yellow-bellied, um, the, the primaries don't have any pale uh, edges. Whereas in uh, uh, many of the other flycatchers, they have these pale edges. And the effect is that when you see the bird from a distance, um, that this appears to have a very black primaries, and this would be kind of grayish or dull primaries and showing little contrast between the primary stack, the base of the primary stack and the tertials themselves. And uh, you can see most of the Western flycatchers are, are weak. Um, so whenever you see a strong wing panel contrast out in California, uh, you know, take a closer look because a lot of the Eastern uh, empids have strong wing panel uh, contrast. Now Hammonds, Hammonds is one that can, is intermediate between uh, weak to, to uh, medium uh, and, and can in fact be confused even with uh, uh, least uh, strong. So, um, but the rest of those here uh, tend to have uh, uh, consistently weak wing panel 
contrast. So here's that same photo. Uh, we had just looked at the wing bar contrast, and now you can see, look at the, here's the wing panel on the least, not a lot of pale edges, and then look at all these white stripes here. Then let's go to the other extreme, gray flycatcher, pale edges on the tertials, and also pale edges here. And so it just looks like it's gray, 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 down to the primaries here. And then Hammond is somewhere in, somewhere in between. And uh, Dusky would be over uh, here uh, in general. Dusky is somewhere in between, I guess, here. And uh, Hammond's is a little bit more closer to uh, least in, in terms of this entire spectrum. So you can see we're building up all the parts of the bird here uh, to, to bring you uh, together. Um, so uh, color contrasts are, are very important, I think. Um, there's another one about color contrast that uh, I think I uh, put at the end. I guess I should have put it right now, but that's OK. We're going we're gonna to go back to structure here. And we had talked about um, tail length uh, as one uh, feature to pay attention to. But the other one is um, tail width. And again, this is both an absolute sense and, a, and an impression. Um, and Andy's drawn uh, two here. This one would be, we would call narrow. And this one would be kind of wide. Um, and the way I think about it is often the narrow ones, you'll see them even taper inwards to the base uh, of the tail here, whereas the wide ones tend to be pretty, um, there's no taper. They're almost parallel uh, sides there. And I always feel like I can just twist the tail off of these narrow tailed flycatchers. And this one, uh, uh, they all seem more stiff tailed. And so the, the, the wider tails, associated with like willow flycatcher, alder flycatcher, Acadians, and also peewees. Um, and, that, and that's actually one of the reasons why um, uh, peewees can, and vice versa, are confused with uh, willow uh, flycatchers, in addition to dull uh, wing bars and overall you know, lack of eye ring. Um, but uh, Pacific Slope, Hammonds, Gray, Dusky, Least, they all have uh, narrow tails. Okay. And it's pretty consistent. And you can uh, see that in, in, uh, even when the bird is in a profile shot where you don't see the tail from below. It's a, it gives you a certain impression. Um, OK, and we're going to jump back to color contrast. I meant this to be the one before. But uh, throat um, and belly contrast uh, is another important feature. And again, uh, we, Andy and I, when we talk about contrast, is it's always about relative to something. And so here we're thinking relative to upper parts or the cheek, uh, you know, the, the side of the face and, and the, the back. Um, and you, we focus typically on the chin and the throat and compare it to the sides of the face or the back. And uh, Hammonds would be the classic uh, end of the spectrum here where there's very little contrast um, between the back side of the face and the throat. They tend to be all gray. Now you have to be careful, a bird that's backlit or birds that's lit from this side from the sun and a lot of shading in the back could give you uh, false impressions. But as long as you don't have that, um, uh, th those color contrasts uh, are, or lack of the contrast is fairly diagnostic of a, a number of these birds uh, here. And uh, you go to the other extreme, say least, um, they, they uh, have a strong contrast between the chin and throat and the upper sides. And this even holds when the bird is not really in, you know, the bird might be in shade and everything looks kind of dull, but you can still see the contrast or the lack of contrast. Okay? And then of course you have birds that are somewhere in the middle. So again, I don't focus on color. Uh, but rather on contrast between different parts of the body or the, the wing, different parts of the wing. So here, let's uh, another poll, serve poll number five. Uh, here's a MPID, and um, is it a weak 
intermediate or strong. And what I want you to focus on is look at this area and then compare it to its cheek and the back. Um, do you call this a strong contrast, like a very light throat compared to the back or a weak one where it's pretty much continuous or concolorous uh, cross from the chin to the back? The votes are coming in. And this is like one of those uh, uh, eye optometrist tests. <laughs> You're medium or strong. <laughs> and let's do it again. <laughs> is A better or B better? <laughs> and it looks like the polling votes are slowing down. So I'm going to end the polling and share the results. And here you go. There we go. Okay, good. Yeah, so most of you said weak. Um, I would have said weak as well. Um, some of you said uh, intermediate. Um, that's okay too. Again, these are, when you look at these scorecards, um, it's, it's not like it's always weak. If you said weak and intermediate, it's still, still useful. Uh, most of you didn't think it was a strong uh, contrast. Uh, so this is a Hammond's flycatcher. Uh, kind of a dusky undersides, dusky appearance, round, very, look at those long wingtips, primary extension, and uh, the narrow tail that even tapers in towards the base, and the dusky small bill. Um, and those would be the features I'd use to ID this as uh, Hammonds. The, the eye ring doesn't do me much good. They all, they all have a lot of eye rings. Okay, I, I, here's another one. Um, this one, I, you may have seen this photo already because I, I, I showed it in the previous one, but hopefully you don't remember what it was. Uh, same, same question here. And uh, if the last one that Hammonds had weak, uh, if you can keep that mental image in your head, now compare this one. The last one was weak. Um, is this one weak, intermediate, or strong? So look at the chin and then compare it to the back or the head. Is it much lighter or the same darkness or, or somewhere in between? And the votes are rolling in. And it looks like they're kind of slowing down. Give them a few more seconds. Get your last votes in. And the polling is ending. And here are the results. And there we go. Strong. Um, perfect. So 90% said strong. So you can see the difference, right? Uh, so yeah, so this is the least uh, flycatcher. The face of this, this fellow looks very much like the Hammonds. So that's not particularly useful, the eye ring part, but uh, that contrast between the undersides and the back, the very strong uh, wing bar contrast relative to the back. Uh, and uh, of course the medium uh, primary extension and the entirely orange lower mandible. So we use all of those things together uh, to ID. I would obviously not, uh, focus only on upper part, under part contrast uh, due to all the potential pitfalls. But you can see here, uh, it's very different from the, uh, the Hammond. So it's it's become very useful, you know, out here and uh, we will get reports of uh, a lot of MPIDs out in Texas in the winter. And they, you know, they come in, uh, you know, being reported as Hammonds or lease, but we can very quickly sort through them and say, ah, oh, from the, this under part, under part, uh, upper part contrast that it's not a Hammonds or it's not a least. And similarly, we can do that in California. So move pretty fast. So everything I did there, um, I hope this, this, this scorecard um, makes a little bit more sense. The idea is uh, least you could take, or let's take um, move this out of the way, Hammonds. Right, Hammonds, when we go down to tail length, they would say um, it can have a tail length that's anywhere between short and medium, but never long. 
so each bird has a unique uh, set of all these scores. Any individual um, feature is probably not sufficient to ID the bird, but when you put everything together from the, the mandible color to the bill size, tail length, primary extension, tail width, a forehead angle, and, and uh, uh, these other contrasts, it's pretty diagnostic. And what we found is even if you don't have all of this information, uh, let's say you have 50% of this information, you know, the bird was moving around or mosquitoes are biting you or uh, you don't have time to see everything or you forgot or you just didn't notice, it still uh, can get you very close to the ballpark uh, of the, the bird. Um, but the main thing is this is, and, and all the illustrations that Andy has, which are basically to go with this so that you can calibrate your eye to uh, what these terms are, uh, mean. Um, they're there to, to help you learn uh, how to see empidinaxes in, in a new light. Um, and again, I'm not so worried about the identification or the name, just uh, us learning how to identify the birds um, or what to pay attention to. Um, I'm going to, Andy and I uh, took some uh, videos from, uh, that were uh, from YouTube just to show you a few things about behavior. Of course, uh, uh, these birds are, are dynamic and um, they flick their wings or they drop their tails, they flick their tails. Uh, we often hear about, uh, say, like gray flycatcher uh, likes to drop its tail down uh, slowly, um, uh, kind of like a Phoebe, and, and in many cases it is diagnostic. And so uh, here is a gray flycatcher. Um, So some, some uh, flycatchers, uh, like the gray, have that distinctive tail dropping, um, but you have to be careful. Um, there are other birds that, uh, um, whoops, uh, what happened there? Uh, okay, here we go. Um, any of the flycatchers will flick their wings or flick their tails. Here's a dusky flycatcher. Doing a uh, tail pumping. Its way of tail pumping is slightly different than the gray flycatcher, but it's so similar that um, if, you're not, uh, if you haven't seen a lot of tail pumping, uh, you could easily just look at this and say, oh, it's a gray flycatcher. Here's a Pacific Slope from Texas this year. This one's a little bit calmer, doesn't do much tail pumping. It'll flick its tail uh, once in a while. It will do some wing flicking, but sometimes it's uh, pretty uh, slow, not doing much. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that wing flicking and tail flicking or pumping, uh, you can really use that with caution. Um, uh, I actually don't think it's as diagnostic as most of the other features that I pointed out, except 
uh, for the case of the gray flycatcher, uh, it's generally diagnostic. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through uh, the species accounts in a sense. Well, after now that you've seen all of those um, metrics in Andy's illustrations, let's let's go through some of these birds. So Pacific slope flycatcher, obviously that teardrop uh, eye shape uh, eye ring, um, although sometimes it could be hard to see. Um, the uh, wing bar contrast is low, generally compared to the mantle. They tend to have fairly long, uh, medium to long primary uh, extensions, completely orange lower mandible, medium length bill. Um, no contrast between underparts and upper parts. Now this one is backlit. This is immature, uh, so that that's an that's an example of a showing you a pitfall uh, there. Uh, Crest, typically a crested appearance, but it can put that crest down. Uh, and so out in California, I remember we we're always trying to look for yellow-bellied flycatchers in the fall. Uh, and every time we see one with a rounded head, we get excited. Uh, we'll come back to yellow-bellied uh, later, for, but uh, this is the um, Pacific Slope. Uh, Hammonds, we've gone through, look at that steep forehead angle, long primary extension. There you go. This one is super long here. Um, fairly short tail, low contrast between throats and back. This one's backlit, so you really want to look at this part right here. And a uh, medium contrast of wing bars, medium wing panel contrast, dusky lower mandible. Uh, but yeah, look at that steep forehead in, in all of these. Uh, willow flycatcher. The one that looks so much like a peewee or, and is uh, often confused with peewees. Um, and you can see why. It's got dull wing bars, very low contrast birds everywhere. Uh, fairly long primary extension, medium to long, uh, like a peewee. A peewee is actually much longer. Um, uh, medium to heavy bill, again, like a peewee. Um, no eye ring much like peewees. So typically willows are not confused with other empids, usually just with peewees. Um, what else can I say uh, about this? Uh, well, out in the east, we, we have to worry about alder flycatcher. Uh, although I know there are, there's a, there are a couple alder records for California, incredibly rare in California, but nonetheless, they, there have been some records in California and uh, often thought to be indistinguishable, but uh, typically, uh, willows will show more of a crest than alder flycatchers, just for your information. Uh, gray flycatcher, um, gray, uh, dull, low contrast, everything. Everything is low contrast, low wing panel contrast, um, medium to short primary extension. This one almost looks like it has a long primary extension, but uh, uh, it's, it's the way the wing is held. You, you need to look at it from this point onward, not from here. And a uh, heavy uh, bill, narrow bill, long tail. Um, it does have white outer tail feathers. That's quite diagnostic of gray. It's hard to see, so I haven't really put that in our discussions. Uh, but when you see it, then, then you, that's good. Long tail. Um, dusky. Dusky is some is a one that's somewhat intermediate, I say, between gray and Hammonds. So it's like a gray and Hammonds got together and made it a, a dusky, and um, you know, kind of uh, low contrast uh, features here. Uh, the tail is not as long as a uh, gray, but uh, uh, longer than say a Hammonds. Uh, shallow forehead. Uh, Dark chest. Dark chest is more like Hammond's, but shallow forehead is more like gray. So you can see what I mean by it's somewhere in between those two, two species. Um, and then last but not least for the typical, the, the things that you might encounter uh, in the West would be a least flycatcher. Um, rare but regular vagrant. Very contrasty bird. Um, we've already gone through this photo, but let me show you some other 
uh, things. Here, here's one where it's like you almost have no field marks to, to work with, but you can see the side of the face and you can see the chest. The chest is white and then the side of the face is kind of dark. Hammonds would never look like this. So just even from this photo, you can tell it's not a Hammonds. This is a least. Um, you can also see the narrow tail, which we'll come back to later. This one's tail may not look so narrow, but it tapers inward. Uh, it's, this is more of a shortening effect from the zoom lens that I had. Um, but again, look at the contrast uh, here. This is a first year bird in the fall. And uh, medium to shallow forehead angle. Can't see that on this one. So um, that's what we have on sort of plumage and structural features. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Andy here to talk about uh, calls. Um, Thanks. Yeah. So as part of the holistic approach, you know, calls are obviously an important factor and can actually be diagnostic in cases. Um, we're not talking about songs and we're not talking about calls that you know, birds may be giving on the breeding grounds, you know, it's, it's more than we can get into, you know, this evening, but, uh, you know, just talking about some of the common calls that a migrant might, might give. So what we're looking at here is a spectrogram in case you're not familiar. Um, on the Y axis, the, the, uh, the vertical axis there, we see frequency, uh, you know, which is a measurement of sound waves per second. Um, you know, we humans tend to refer to you know, it has pitch. We, we tend to refer to, uh, you know, whether a bird has a high pitch or a, a low pitch, how high it appears on that spectrogram. Um, for instance, you know, sparrows and warblers, which you may sort of think of as a fairly sort of high pitch call note, tend to be in that six to 10k range here. Um, and then on the x axis, the horizontal axis, we have time. So you can obviously sort of see just as a glance here, we're talking about very short calls. Um, you know, certainly a lot less than a, a second, very short calls here. Um, one thing that we don't have on here is Pacific Slope, because that's actually quite a long, very distinctive call, and it wouldn't actually even fit on this chart. It's how long it is in comparison to, to the rest of these. Um, so if we look here, we can see Willow, Least, Dusky Gray, all give this wit-like call. Uh, Willow tends to be in this sort of two to seven K range. And there is this inflection around the seven K. You can kind of see where Cinti's pointer is. It sort of bends back. Um, least, which gives um, a harder, harsher call uh, is also in that two to seven K range. Um, also take a notice, you, you know, you'll see these all poly polyphonic calls. There's sort of two bands there. And so that harmonic on least, you know, it tends to be much more, pre uh, you know, prominent than you would see on dusky or gray. It's got a harsher call. Um, you know, I think Kimball, uh, you know, uh, likens it to Audubon's warbler in terms of that harsh ch sound. And it, if you actually look at a, a spectrogram of an Audubon's warbler call, it's actually very, very similar um, in terms of, you know, the, the placement of the harmonic. Um, where, whereas dusky and gray, uh, you know, that harmonic is less prominent. It's usually sort of further up um, and their range is, is less. It's more in the three to six K range. You know, these are very subtle differences here. Um, and, you know, I think we would have to tread very lightly in this area. You need to be very experienced, I think, and, and uh, good hearing to separate these wit calls. But when you do uh, record these calls and you can go in on a spectrogram and look at them, there are you know, differences you can see. Um, and we'll go into some detail, particularly on the differences between least and dusky and gray. And then last but not least, Hammonds, which is very helpful. It doesn't give a, a, a wit call. It gives this pip call, um, which has this sort of, sort of inverted you know, V uh, call. Um, and so, you know, it, it can be very helpful if you find an MPID and it's silent, I would encourage you to maybe try and tease it to call. Sometimes they do respond to playback. I should stress, you should never do this during breeding season. You don't want people going out in the San Gabriel's trying to do playback on, on breeding birds up there. I'm talking more about, uh, you know, migrants and, and wintering MPIDs. 
Um, sometimes they can be teased to call. I wouldn't do it if the identity has already been established as well. Again, we're not into harassing birds, but sometimes it can be very helpful, uh, you know, to actually sort of nail down the identification. Um, and, and lastly, with that, I would encourage people to try and record the calls as well. Um, you know, Lance had done a, a great webinar, you know, several months ago on bird recordings. I'm not going to get into the, the details. You can go look at that. But even your smartphone can produce a, a, an excellent quality recording. I've, I often find my smartphone does as good, if not better, uh, than my microphone. And so if you do have a bird that's, that's calling away, that's witting, I would encourage you to record it. It's actually just as important as getting good photographs. So let's take a listen to some of these calls if you want to play the next slide. So this is Pacific Slope Flycatcher. I think... Uh, <laughs> Very distinctive call. I think we all are familiar with it. Um, I actually hear it a lot in movie soundtracks and TV shows that are not even set in California. So the sound designers love it as a evocative sort of forest woodland bird call. Um, so it's one that we're all quite familiar with and I always look forward to listen to it in, in spring. So I don't think there's a lot of confusion there with that call. Let's go over to... Um, I should, I should actually just sort of mention, you know, I know we're not covered Cordillerian, but, you know, you may have seen in that, um, if you go, you see this, it's an unbroken, upslurred, uh, quite long call. Cordillerian is typically broken into two notes. Um, but again, that's not something we're covering here, but just something to note. Next up is Hammonds. <laughs> And Hammonds, you know, produces a number of calls, some on the breeding grounds, but again, you know, this is one of its commoner calls um, and, uh, you, you know, is, is, is diagnostic. If you, for me, I, I find if I, if, if I come across an MPIN, I think it's a Hammonds and I can tease it to make a pip and it does, then I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy and I, I almost don't have to worry too much about anything else. Let's go on to Willow. And Willow does also have, you know, some people, you know, will hear in the spring, uh, there's a, a classic Fitzbue call that people describe. You can hear that from spring migrants. Um, but it does also do this wit call, which is very, very similar to, to these other wits we're going to listen to. Um, again, look at that spectrogram there. You can see it covers a high, uh, broad range of frequency there from 2K all the way up to, in this case, it's it's well over 7K uh, with, a, with a, a nice harmonic that sort of runs up parallel to it as well, which gives it that sort of, it's, it's you know, quite a harsh wit, I guess. Let's go on to um, gray. So this is, you know, a, a sharp and short wit. Uh, people describes it as, as the most unmusical of the Western empids, um, and you know you see it's it's very short there. Uh, it doesn't cover a lot of uh, a lot of time, um, and just quickly upsending. There's no kinks or upslurs or anything to it. It's a fairly straight uh, a straight call. Um, let's go on to let's go on to Dusky. I think yeah. So uh, no one, I, I, I don't know that people can separate Dusky and Gray on the wit call. I certainly wouldn't try to do that. I think there's much better visual clues to try and separate the two. Um, you can sort of hear there that, uh, you know, maybe there's a subtle difference. Uh, you know, Pete Plow describes it as the more musical of the two. You can certainly look at the spectrogram and it's got a slight upslur to it. But I think <clears throat> for the purposes of this, webinar you know you would treat dusky and gray as basically identical um, and fortunately there are much better uh, id features that you can use 
Let's go on to least, which I think is the last. So um, again, looking at the spectrogram there, there's a there's a large, you know, range of frequency that covers all the way from 2K all the way up <coughs> to 7K. It's got this harmonic that runs parallel to it. You notice there's a little kink there in the middle as well on the on the main part of the call, and that's you know a typical <coughs> look for the least call. And I think with experience, and experienced birders, uh, you know, can separate uh, you know least and and find it a diagnostic call. As as I've mentioned earlier, Kimball describes it similar to the the ch sound of an alderman's warbler, and I think that's that's you know a, a very good comparison. Um, and there, there's been more than one, you know, least that's been discovered out of, you know, California vagrants based on its call. I think there's at least one or two records in <coughs> LA County that were discovered by the call, where the observer actually heard the call before they even saw the bird, and we're, we're fairly sure they were dealing with the least. Um, I think, you know, with these these bird calls, it's a good idea just to listen to them a lot. Listen to them on Zeno Canto. eBird has a number of them. Um, to try and get familiar with them and try and record them because <clears throat> there are some differences visually in the spectrograms. Let's move on. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, dusky and, and wit calls. As I'd mentioned, you know, I think it's dangerous to try and separate these two based on <clears throat> the actual call alone. There are some differences you can see in the spectrograms here. You know, Dusky has a little bit of an upslur. I've put together some calls from, you know, a number of different birds from all over the, the country um, and to, uh, you know, to try and, uh, or sort of rather all over the Southwest to try and sort of illustrate that there is a fairly consistent look to the spectrogram of these birds. But that being said, I think, you know, to the human ear, we, we would sort of treat these as, as indistinguishable. Um, but it is interesting to note that there are, you know, differences there visually that you can see and could be useful in, in, in terms of, a, you know, a vagrant dusky, particularly out in, you know, Texas, for instance. You know, if you can get a good recording of it, it, it could be helpful to, to help separate it from, say, a least and, and the same here, at least from dusky. Um, there's some links here to some useful MPID audio references. Um, in fact, Nathan Peeplow and Andrew Spencer's earbirding blog, you know, have a great piece on MPID calls. I think it's I think it's a pine flycatcher posting, but they they've assembled, you know, all the all the sort of southwestern MPID calls there, and uh, you know that it, it, there's nothing new here in terms of what I'm showing. It's all been covered elsewhere, um, but yeah, there's lots of other great resources to look at. Go on to the next slide. Um, dusky and least. So you know this is, this is an area that can be very helpful in 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 terms of a vagrant least. Um, experienced birders, you know, you know, are able to separate them on call. Um, I I would treat all of this as a generalization. Um, I think it's part of the holistic approach. Uh, I definitely have heard uh, some recordings of least flycatcher where it gives a typical sort of dusky like call several wits before it then moves into a, a more typical wit. But as you can see here, you know, the, 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 we've got some lines across the screen just sort of showing you how there's a much greater range of frequency in the least calls um, and how there's this more prominent harmonic um, that also has a greater range of frequency than on, on dusky and, and gray. Um, and uh, yeah, I think really probably just with experience, but again, try and, you know, record, record your, your MPIDs whenever possible, even a, even a smartphone recording will, will be highly valuable. And I think, is that it from the calls? I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, now you should be able to identify every MPID out there. <laughs> um, so yeah, with the with the calls and, and this holistic ID, um, you know, when you come back and study this this uh, this talk, you can you know, look at all of these, uh, look at the scorecard and and uh, the metrics here um, to get your eyes calibrated. Um, so that's 
now come back to here. Um, and we had this, we started off this way. Um, if you could put up the poll run for this one and just see if uh, people have changed their minds now. Um, I know this may not be partic uh, particularly fair because uh, uh, it may have been brain overload um, uh, that we just went through. Um, but hopefully at least now we start to see some of the features we were talking uh, about. A uh, shallow forehead uh, angle, uh, flattish crown, messy eye ring, weak contrast here, right? Um, uh, weak wing panel contrast, short primary extension, uh, medium uh, wing bar contrast, you know, things like that. Um, yes, the votes are kind of dribbling in still. Okay. And they're kind of slowing down. So a few more seconds, get your vote in. And three, two, one. And that's it. Let's see what we got. Okay. And what uh, it looks like 60% say gray. What was uh, the poll results on the poll uh, number one? Okay. I have to stop the share on this. Oh, so I can't remember. 60, so 60% gray. And I believe it was the first one. One second. Yeah. The first one. So this is 60% gray. And here's the first one. And uh, it's also uh, gray. Um, yeah, well, it, it turns out this one is a dusky flycatcher. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> maybe we confused you more. But, but gray and dusky actually are, um, like I said, they can be very, very similar. And uh, the main feature that uh, I would use here is that the tail, maybe this wasn't a fair one, but uh, the tail is a bit longer on the gray uh, flycatcher and the wing bar contrast is uh, uh, much less. Um, okay, well, uh, <laughs> that didn't work so well. <laughs> Let's try. Uh, this one. Survey eight. And so, uh, but I think what's uh, what we you should do is afterwards, um, you know, review the things that we went through in this talk uh, with the bird names uh, uh, against them. That that'll help. Absolutely. There's but, a lot a lot of studying to do. But what's clear is uh, people's uh, views changed. So um, you're, you're seeing these different features. So this one, shallow forehead. Well, we'll I'll, I'll leave it at that for, for now for a second. Um, and the votes are still dribbling in a bit. And get your last votes in. Three, two, and one, and here are the results. Okay. Um, least, uh, it looks like it wins by just the narrowest of margins, Willow being the uh, second one. Um, and I don't remember what the survey two had said. Well, uh, one second, let me pull that up. I know it wasn't least. Least was not the winner of the survey, too. No. Willow. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so um, definitely we're, uh, I think that that's progress. Um, now, it's interesting that uh, I, I like these polls because it gives Andy and I um, you know, we, you, you know, we, if you look at these things too long, <laughs> you, you start to think you know know what you're doing, but you, you might not. <laughs> um, and so the, the fact that 
a lot of others suggested it was willow is quite uh, interesting. Um, so this is at least um, flycatcher. And uh, first I'll, I'll go through why, why we think it's a, a least here, the, the bold uh, wing bars uh, here. There is an eye ring and there's pale ores, I mean, kind of a messy eye ring. Um, and then, uh, so the contrast uh, of the chin and throat relative to the, to the back and the short primary extension here. Um, and then, well, it's hard to see, but the, the tail seems on the slightly long side compared, to, uh, it's short, uh, shorter than gray and, uh, but uh, feels a bit longer than, than say a, a willow flycatcher, but that's a subtle feature. But I can see how one might uh, confuse this with a willow because its eye ring is maybe not as bold as, as, as the, the brightest and least flycatchers. Um, and so uh, that can give you the impression uh, of an alder. Now, interestingly, out in the east, um, the, and I, I alluded to it earlier, one of the underappreciated um, ID problems is actually least an alder flycatcher. They can look quite uh, similar. Uh, if I took this guy's, blocked off his head, it might be tough to tell the difference between a least and an alder, because alder actually can have uh, uh, bolder wing bars than, than a willow. Um, but anyway, uh, pretty bright uh, undersides. Okay, so uh, this right here, um, Andy's just illustrating um, uh, examples of sort of dull uh, MPIDs. Again, trying to show you that color is not something we always want to rely on, but rather uh, contrast and uh, structural uh, features. And I'll sort of leave this for you to uh, contemplate uh, after the talk. Um, here, we're going to kind of move into a, a little bit more discussion on some of the potential vagrants. But uh, the first, of course, is looking for least flycatchers in California. So Dusky Hammond's least uh, comparison. Um, focus on the primary extension. Focus on the under part, upper part contrast from least, which are very strong, and then Dusky and Hammond's having a fairly weak uh, contrasts there. Um, if you get a view of the bill from below, that can uh, sometimes help. Uh, not so much between Hammond's and Dusky, except maybe the color, uh, but the bill of the least tends, tends to be a little wider, although uh, it takes some experience to actually be able to see that in the field. And, and half the time you, you won't see that, uh, you don't get that view. Um, more uh, for you to uh, examine uh, later on. Um, but again, looking for at least, look for the white uh, underparts. Uh, and that'll give you a sign. Um, and the, sh uh, the relatively short primary extension uh, relative to Hammond's. Now, at least can be a bright dusky, can approach a, a dull least. So you do have to be careful of the, this pair right here. So here um, are some examples. Here's uh, the Hammonds, least, uh, Dusky, Flycatcher here. Same one that uh, Brad had photographed, the one that we used for the, the first poll, just in a different uh, posture. Um, but uh, yeah, look at the very different contrast between this Hammonds actually looks like it has a, some contrast there. Uh, so you do, uh, again, one, one field mark alone is you never want to rely on that by itself. Okay. Um, for completeness, we just want to touch on a few of the Eastern uh, vagrants. Um, 
we always have been, you know, in California, uh, just searching for yellow-bellied flycatchers. Um, and and uh, I think we've come a long ways with the community on um, IDing, uh, separating these two right here. And there's some good articles uh, about this. Um, I think uh, the eye ring is something, of course, you do want to focus on. If you have a teardrop shaped eye ring, it's pretty likely it's a Pacific Slope or Cordilleran. And, and if it's uh, uh, sort of uniform thickness around and crisp, uh, where, uh, it's a good sign it's a yellow bellied flycatcher. But again, sometimes it can be a little messy, or sometimes this teardrop is, is missing and, and uh, you know, get us um, a bit uh, excited. Uh, but one uh, feature that is very uh, uh, good is what's going on um, in the wings. So first, the wing panel contrast. Uh, the yellow belly, the primary stack, does not have pale edges. So it's just jet black. So it contrasts with the pale edges of the uh, tertial stacks. Whereas in Western flycatchers, uh, they're typically pale edged. And here's one where Andy's drama where uh, purposely so it's somewhat intermediate. But uh, when you see pale edges there, uh, you, can pretty, you can be pretty much sure it's not a yellow belly. And if you see a jet black, it's not a Western uh, flycatcher. Uh, wing bar contrast is also in, important. Um, both have bold wing bars, but typically the Western wing bars have just a, a hint of uh, like buff or yellow uh, on them, whereas the yellow bellies they can be, they tend to be a little bit whiter, so they contrast more with the upper parts uh, here. So those are the things that uh, we typically look for. Head shape matters or helps, but uh, again, you can flatten the crown sometimes on the Western. Uh, yellow bellied will almost never show a peak, uh, I mean a crest. It might show a little bit of a peak, but no crest. Um, okay, so here, here is uh, a yellow bellied and a uh, Western or Pacific slope flycatcher, particularly dull one here. Um, but what I wanted to uh, focus on here is look at these pale edges there. Um, and here, pretty dark. Uh, and at least the edges, you don't, they're not anywhere near as pale as the tertials, whereas these are very much like the tertials. Um, and I should mention one other feature uh, that Andy illustrated here is often, but not, not always, the Western flycatchers, those pale edges on the tertials, they tend to go all the way up uh, or closer and sometimes right up to the, um, the, the wing bars right here. Whereas in um, the yellow belly, they, they don't go that far up. So there's a big black patch right here. Uh, uh, closer to the wing bars. So then the, you can see um, that effect here. See these go right up to the uh, coverts there, greater coverts, and then these stop a little bit short here. So it's dark over here. And the bold, look at the bold wing bars. Um, of course, this one's a little bit uh, uh, worn out. So uh, don't don't focus on the dull wing bars there. It should, should generally be stronger. Um, yeah, and you can see the eye rings, both have bold eye rings, but this one doesn't show just a hint of that teardrop. So eye ring by, it's by itself is not always diagnostic. Um, again, the call, if you can hear the call with the Pacific Slope or the Cordilleran, uh, you immediately know it's not a yellow bellied or, and vice versa. And so we're coming to an end. Um, I, uh, we have here, uh, uh, Andy's illustrated alder flycatcher and uh, Acadian flycatcher. Um, we're not gonna spend too much time on this since it's more of a Western flavored uh, talk, um, but I'd like to uh, point out, uh, well, uh, maybe focus on the Acadian. The alder is actually very similar to willow I think we'd want to, we could have a different talk just on willow and alder and, and actually have to accept that sometimes you just can't tell the difference between these, these two unless you hear them uh, call. 
Um, but quickly, alder compared to willow, uh, they are kind of on the dull end of MPIDs, but compared to willow, alders typically are more boldly uh, marked. Um, they have an uh, indistinct eye ring, or I, I should say they have a um, not much of an eye ring, but they do have a very, very thin eye ring around that you might describe as being very crisp. Uh, whereas in the willow, there is almost no eye ring, or if there's some paleness around the eye, it might be a, a more on the messy uh, side. And the crown tends to be round, and on willow, uh, it tends to be slightly uh, peaked. Um, but again, those are generalities, and you can use them to give you a hint that you might have an alder, uh, but you absolutely need to confirm it, uh, a vagrant alder in California with a, with a call. Um, Acadian, I don't think there's yet been a record of Acadian in, in um, uh, California or even the West, uh, but I could be wrong. Uh, peculiar why they don't get out there. Um, but uh, uh, it's a very distinctive bird and very long primary extension, very white below like a least flycatcher, uh, but a heavy bill and a very crisp eye ring as opposed to like a yellow bellied, um, but, but very unlike a least, which would be a bolder, wider, I mean, and, and messier. Um, but maybe more importantly, why I put these up is uh, for the Western uh, flavor for the California birds is just to give you some examples of impids with uh, wide tails or fat tails. We gave you one that was the willow, but uh, I'll sh I just wanted to show you some more pictures of that. Uh, just so you know, when you're out there, if you see an impid with a wide tail, um, wow, you know, pay attention. So here, here's a uh, least flycatcher. And then on the right is a uh, Acadian flycatcher. I forgot to put the label uh, here. And um, the upper parts, this part actually looks very much like a least in, in many respects, maybe a heavier bill, but the contrast level is the same. Obviously the wing tips are much uh, longer, um, but the width of the tail uh, is different. Uh, least has that narrow tail. And uh, here from looking from underneath, is a Acadian. Look at those long primary extensions, but a fairly wide tail. And even on the profile shot, uh, you can't see that it's wide, but you, at least I think, or I feel that it's a stiff, sort of a stiff tail here, um, a stiff tailed look as opposed to the least, which is, is kind of a thin, small tail coming off the body. This is, this is a chunky tail there. And so willows, and, and uh, to some extent, alders also uh, are like this, and uh, Acadian is probably more on the extreme, of course. So, well, um, uh, I end with this um, for you to look at. Um, and hopefully you'll, uh, you can use this in conjunction with the illustrations to, to help you learn how to see MPIDs in a different light. And uh, with that, um, I guess uh, Andy and I would like to thank you for tuning in um, and we're open to uh, answering any questions and or discussing. Um, we have a few uh, eBird uh, photos, not ours, we, uh, that we put up for potential discussion if, if any of you wanted to, to talk about them. But uh, other than that, uh, uh, the, we're opening up now to questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you very, very, very much to both uh, you and Andy. Um, do you want to, uh, do you want me to read uh, the questions? We have several from the question and answers, or would you like to go ahead and uh, hit the questions and answers? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, some are, uh, hi, John. John Dunn. Um, as a comment, uh, nominate subspecies of willow is earlier by uh, May 1 in Texas. Uh, Brewster I wintered at Arboretum in Arcadia, found it in December, winters north to western Mexico. Um, 
yeah uh john john dunn uh you know uh, knows all about the uh statuses uh, <laughs> um thanks john for that uh added information um uh let's see what else does he have it is tertial edge contrast two um, uh, of course yeah it came in during a um during a wing conversation, or a con uh, conversation. yeah yeah um, unfortunately um, i don't recall what the specific slide was you were discussing yeah i'm sure we were talking about wing panel contrasts there um yeah i guess uh i don't know is can john uh talk here or yes or, he can because that might help <laughs> <laughs> one second let me And John then also mentions further down below that that the western willows uh, look different than the eastern willows, and that's true. They. John, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, John. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, hey, how's it going? Um, no, the tertial the comment was based on the. The eastern impids, the wing bars are sharper, the wing is darker, and it's not just the wing bars, it's the tertial edges that really jump off and are against a dark center. So they're cleanly delineated. So all I tried to say was not just the wing bars, look at the tertials too. Less oh, exactly. dramatic than hammonds, but use more useful in duskies and grays, where it all tends to blend a little more against a browner wing. Um, yeah, and then the willow stuff. I've seen willow as early as 30 April uh, in the lower valley uh, with the nominate subspecies. And we have willows arriving all the way up at Lake Erie uh, about 11, 12 May. And I've seen my earliest willows ever in California with Brewster, I no doubt, are uh, twice on 11 May. And usually not till after 20 May. Um, so it, it part depends on the population you're talking about. Um, and then the, that, that face contrast, when you got to alders, they have a nice dark face, sets off the throat. It's, it's more blended in willows, uh, except for Brewster eye, which is more dark. But Brewster eye, the wings are um, dull and blended. Uh, so it's really a confusing mess and we're trying to remember, but I always start off learn status and distribution as a starting point. And the relic, for instance, Dusky is the dominant spring migrant impid up here. And yet alone Dusky in Southeast California is no more than casual. So how do you figure that? They come up from West Mexico. Why are they so rare in Southeast California? So numerous up here, of course, I'm very near where they nest. But those are just some comments um, offhand. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. OK. There were a couple of other questions that came up. Um, oh, specimen of Acadian for, oh, I did know about the specimen of Acadian for Arizona. I forgot about them. But British Columbia, uh, yeah, that's crazy. It um, is crazy. <laughs> and, and, and Tate, can you hear me? I can, yeah. yeah. So the two of the, I think two of the four records for Europe of empids are Acadian. One for Iceland, one for Great Britain, Eastern Great, Eastern England and Kent. But remember, Acadian crosses water. It's the only trans Gulf migrant, as you know, yeah. from Texas. So yeah, cross long, is it's a long less migrant. Least doesn't even cross from the Yucatan to Cozumel Island, and it's only 10 miles away. <laughs> That's funny. You know, John, while we have you on the line as well, um, Lily had a question. 
um, have any impids been known to hybridize? <laughs> that must be impid spur. <laughs> <laughs> That's a John question. Uh, John, uh, Andy and I can answer that. <laughs> I've never heard of an impid hybrid, and I don't know if one would ever be sorted out. Um, right. <laughs> I sort of like identifying who has ever, we see male cinnamon um, blue-winged teal hybrids. I don't know if anyone's ever had the guts to call a female hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Alvaro Har Jaramillo also um, had his qu uh, hand raised. Did you want to speak, Alvaro? You can unmute yourself, I believe. Oh, it might have been an accidental hand raise. Okay. Thank you, Lily. We appreciate that. There's some more here. Uh, okay. Which one do we uh, Oh, you can, Marge, oh, Ken Ely asks, are yeah. the white edges of the white of the wing feathers a factor in ID? Uh, edges of the wing feathers. Yes, um, and uh, depending on which one, I mean, that the, the, those factor into the uh, wing panel contrast, um, uh, and also what John Dunn uh, just uh, mentioned about the uh, the tertial edge contrast with the ground part of the the wings. Um, yeah, it's uh, essentially that's what we've been. Uh, talking about white edges of the wing feathers, but uh, talking about it in the context of these panel uh, yeah. you know, contrasts. So yeah. The... Absolutely. And sometimes questions come up, you know, because you are on a slide and yeah. uh, we don't get to it till after <laughs> till later. Uh, Nancy, I think it's Salem, um, says, can, can you send the scorecard via email or have it so it can be printed out? Is there any way we can get a copy of the scorecard? Yeah, yeah, we can send it to you. Okay, if you can send it to us, uh, we will post it on our website under this webinar. And okay. So people can take a look at it. Thank you. And, um, oh, and Mary. Mary. Hey, Mary. Um, yeah, Mary's question is there elevation differences of Dusky versus Hammonds? Uh, please elaborate if they are. And I, I assume you mean uh, in breeding season. And that again, probably is better for John Dunn to answer. Um, but my sense is Hammonds uh, is often at higher uh, uh, elevation than, uh, than Dusky's. Yeah, and Mary does confirm, yes, she does mean in breeding season. Can I interrupt on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, Hammonds is both, and gains the tails as well, both nested in the Sierra. So duskies are both below and above Hammonds. Oh, okay. They nest in more lightly wooded habitats, more open. And so when you get to that red fur belt, at um, oh say six six thousand or fifty five hundred to uh, sixty five hundred feet seven thousand feet it's all it's mainly Hammonds but and within the closed canopy forest uh, whereas duskies are below that and more open ponderosa pine and above that all the way up to nearly tree line. Oh wow! Thanks, John. Okay, and Mary does uh, indicate that uh, her and Nick, I presume, found both in Southern Sierra one summer, so she want, just wanted to verify that observation. Um, and John, you mentioned something about Phil Unit finding Oh, it. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Phil, Phil really made a major breakthrough. He not only really learned how to tell willows and alders, and partly depended on which subspecies group of willows, your Western uh, Brewster eye, Extimus, or Nominate, 
in comparison to alder and different criteria. But he also found where they wintered and uh, Western birds for, from West Mexico into Central America and the Eastern willows, which are circumgulf migrants up through South Texas, he found uh, the winter grounds are in Venezuela. So much longer distance migrants. Mm, um, interesting. And that's all based on specimens, which he got from all over the country. He published it somewhere. Uh, and Phil, I think, spent years working on this. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Well, um, we have really um, <laughs> taken up a lot of your time, and we are very, very appreciative for uh, what uh, both you, Cynthia, and you, Andy, have uh, given to this talk. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I did, I did just want to say I want to make sure Larry Allen gets full credit for the LA County Breeding Bird Atlas maps we use. Um, so I got a reminder of that in the chat. So thank you. Sorry for about that. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I, I didn't. I, I just had LA County breeding. So I want to make sure you got full credit for that. And then just to follow on what John said in terms of learning status and distribution, you know, uh, Desi used it in his talk for hummingbirds. You know, I, I would encourage people to go to eBird, explore regions, LA County, um, and then look at your bar charts and that will tell you that you should not be seeing a Western wood peewee in the middle of winter, or if you're up in the San Gabriels and it's June, you shouldn't be seeing Hammond's flycatcher. Those sorts of things will obviously really help, uh, you know, people who are coming to grips with identification. So I'd use those bar charts as well to give you a good idea of what you can see. In them. Absolutely. Um, I see one more while I still have you guys on the line. Uh, oh, uh, Mary asks, uh, so when is your publication coming out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. And the Never. Never it never does. It, it sits on a dusty shelf. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been working on lots of things for, for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that all but we're of us... closer today than we are uh, last year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, thank you very, very much for giving this wonderful, wonderful webinar for us. Uh, Mark, yeah, thanks there... so much. Mark, uh, next, don't forget, uh, we have Mark Shield next week, next Tuesday at 7 o'clock on Sapsuckers and something not to be missed. And uh, Mark, is there anything else that we need to add? No, I don't think there's anything else. Um, thank you so much, uh, Cinti and Andy. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you, and I hope your house is doing better, Cindy, now that <laughs> the uh, cold snap has uh, kind of kind of gotten better. <laughs> yeah, it, it's all good. Spring is here. Oh, good, good. That's Anyways, what <laughs> this uh, this webinar will be is has been recorded. So um, you know, once it's up on our site, please, please go uh, to our website and check it out. And once again, thank you very much. And uh, well, I guess we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Yep, thank, thank you. Take care. See you all. Bye-bye now.